Well, welcome again to um, our opportunity to gather for worship and for fellowship. Uh, we're really glad that you uh, joined us today and we've uh, got a, a great theme today to talk about the faithfulness of God and how we can be faithful as the fruit of our lives um, uh, bound in Jesus Christ. And as we gather together, uh, I hope that you'll open your heart to what God would have to say to you uh, through music and song, through his word and uh, through the prayers and uh, continue to remain faithful to our, our calling in Jesus Christ. Uh, before I sing our first song, let me just uh, remind you of uh, a couple of, of things that are happening that uh, may help you in your spiritual journey. Uh, we continue on with the series Jesus the Game Changer and uh, we're pretty uh, deep into that at the moment and you can access that through our church website. Uh, one of the quotes out of this week's session says, to be faithful is not necessarily an easy road, and in fact, uh, more often than not, it's a road that comes with testing and it comes with difficulties. Um, and uh, I know that uh, you know that and I certainly know that. And, uh, but we are faithful in our following after the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we've got a, uh, an opportunity together to open our hearts in worship together, to be the body of Christ in this rather uh, unique circumstance. And uh, begin that today, we're going to sing together a wonderful song that uh, talks about the faithfulness of God, that he is forever faithful. great uh, way to start our time together to sing about the faithfulness of God and uh, if you've been uh, with us uh, uh, in our church uh, uh, online services you'll know that for the last uh, four or five weeks we've been looking at the uh, the great uh, opportunity that we have to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit of God uh, that the fruit of the evidence of uh, God's Spirit within us produces certain uh, attributes and uh, behaviours that otherwise would not manifest themselves. And uh, today we're moving uh, through that list and uh, looking at uh, this wonderful issue of faithfulness, that the fruit of the, God, of the Spirit of God within us or the evidences of that 
our faithfulness. And uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, you might like to, to think about what faithfulness uh, looks like for you. Um, there's lots of uh, definitions about faithfulness as there's definitions for everything but I came across this one that says that faithfulness in the, uh, the, the dictionary meaning of the word says that it means loyalty or dependability, a firm and unchanging attachment to a person or idea. So by definition there's an inference in that word faithfulness that something that faithfulness is something that will be challenged in our lives, that there'll be things that will take us away from being faithful. There are faithful people and they can be relied upon, but that is always under scrutiny and some sense of, um, of danger of being taken away. So this is something that, 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 that we commit to, something that manifests in the evidences of our, of our life, but also something that needs discipline and maintaining. The Bible is full of references uh, that talks about the faithfulness of God. I, w- I want to share a few of them because it gives you a flavour for what the Scriptures say about the God that we worship and serve. Way back in uh, Exodus, the second uh, book of the Bible, it talks uh, about the character of God where God describes himself to Moses. And he says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. A little bit later on in Deuteronomy, I'm not going to go through every book of the Bible, but in Deuteronomy it says that God is the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. He is a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. And then as we move through the the scriptures into the Psalms, the Bible talks about the word of God and says, For the word of the Lord is right and true, that he is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice and the earth is full of his unfailing love. And right throughout the scriptures, we see that the character of God is continually uh, ascribed to faithfulness. This one in, uh, in the Psalms, in Psalm 33, it says, For the word of the Lord, um, sorry, love the Lord uh, your God who reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies, and, and on it goes. And in the New Testament, it talks about that, the fact that God is indeed faithful. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. That's only a smattering of Old and New Testament uh, references, but if you want to have a look at the word faithfulness and how it's attributed to the very character of God, you'll see that over and over again we're reminded of the faithfulness of God, that God is faithful, that his mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Can you, if you're a follower of Christ, think of a time when God has not been faithful to you? Can you think of a time when you have not been faithful to him? And even though you have not been faithful, he has been faithful to you still. God is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. God is faithful. And if you walk through the journey of faith far enough, you know. One of my strongest memories from being a kid in church was watching people around me sing hymns. And uh, one of the hymns they used to sing uh, was that great hymn that's based on that verse uh, that's called Great Is Thy Faithfulness. And uh, many people inside and outside church know that. Um, But I used to look around at all all the old people. They were probably in their 30s and 40s. But I used to look around at them and and think they were singing this with such passion and such um, knowingness, if you like. Because as they walked through the journey of faith, they knew that God had been faithful. Here, God had been faithful. God had been faithful. That he is faithful every day. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. So what that means for us as followers of Christ, or if you haven't entered into a relationship with Christ, what it can mean for you is that you can know this faithful God who is dependable, who shows up, who does what is needed in our lives, Not always what we want, but what is needed. And all the qualities that we're talking about are the evidence of that same God, that same spirit within us. And so now we are part of the now body of Christ, as that beginning video talked about. That church should be a place where his faithfulness flourishes in our faithfulness. And we're going to look at that today.
This week I, I read uh, a, a paper by a church consultant. That's a dangerous thing to do when you're a pastor because you get all kinds of strange ideas from consultants. But this re- I read about this church consultant who shared the results of a study where he'd been hired uh, to survey or consult with a, a very large, um, uh, seemingly very vibrant church. The pastor of this particular church had sensed that there'd been something missing in the life of this rather large church. And even though attendances were going up and offerings were good and, and, and all of that sort of stuff, those sort of markers that you kind of look to, he, he just felt that there was something missing. Because the truth is that graphs uh, and figures don't always reveal health. So when this consultant uh, interviewed the church, he found that the participants in that church were very enthusiastic about the church. And they would say things like, we love it here. The music's wonderful. The sermons are pretty relevant to my needs. Uh, My kids even like coming to this church. And then he asked a second question. He said, so if I took all those things away, that the pastor resigned and the the music kind of changed and the the kids' program sort of wasn't what you wanted, uh, what would you do then? And without hesitation, over 90% of this big percentile that he, he interviewed said, oh, we just leave. We'd find a church that meets our needs. That's an interesting conclusion, I think. Here's a question, and I don't mean any offence, but when did church exist to meet yours and my needs? When did church become just another thing that we consume? When did church become all about what we need and what we want? The truth is, in an evangelical circle, that in the high 90 percentile, growth from church to church happens largely with this group of people leaving this church to go to this church and that group of people leaving that church to go to this church and on it goes. It's like a carousel of disgruntled people. Now, there's nothing wrong with changing churches, don't get me wrong, but there is an element in which we can become consumers of what God has called us to do rather than contributors to it. A church, a healthy church, can only function as God designed it when we bear ourselves the fruit of faithfulness. And we're going to look at how we might do that in just a little while. It's not about the church meeting your needs. It's about joining the mission of God's people to meet the world's needs. And that's a radically different view of faithfulness. So in a few moments' time, we're going to sing together a song that reminds us of where our spirit and where our heart should lay, that the problems of life will come, but where do we find the faithfulness that we so often need? We need it in the presence and the power of God. So you can sit back and listen. You can take in some of these words that will be sung and that together you might know about the faithfulness of God.
They're very challenging words, very hard words, aren't they? That will keep the, our eyes above the waves. Um, and the way we do that is because we acknowledge uh, of uh, who we are with. And that's uh, not always easy, but it is something that we're called to and we get better at as we exercise faithfulness and faith in the one who is faithful, the one who we call our God, the one who is worthy of our following. I will uh, hope that um, as we go through this time together that you will be aware of, um, of knowing that, that God is faithful, that he is indeed faithful to you and faithful in a way that even you cannot be faithful just yet, but he is faithful nonetheless. Um, how do we sort of express this spirit um, evidence in us? How does it sort of manifest itself in our lives? Well, an obvious one is to be faithful in our relationships. Um, in the book of Romans, in chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible says this very simple statement that we are to honour and respect one another. Boy, what a different world we would have if we simply honoured and respected one another. Healthy, faithful relationships marked by honour and respect. And that comes from the fruit of faithfulness, to be faithful in our relationships. 
There was a, a, a paraphrase or a translator of the Bible called J.B. Phillips. Some of you might have heard his name. And he translates these, this very simple uh, uh, honour and respect one another by saying this, uh, of translating it in a paraphrase. And he says, let's have no imitation Christian love. Let's have real warm affection for one another as between brothers and sisters and a willingness to let the other person have the credit. All people come together as equals in Jesus Christ. Equal, diverse, but different, but equal, if you like. And the scriptures tell us that because of Jesus Christ, there is a whole new way of living. That now there is no longer Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. I read about another church this week that had a really interesting serve, uh, 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 kind of statement, if you like, or a sign in their kind of space where they, they worship. And uh, it was interesting to me because it, it only had two words on it. It said, servant's entrance. And uh, it was kind of a bit old looking and stuff, but I thought, boy, that's a great expression of what it is to, to, to be bonded to the, the very will of God in our relationships, to serve one another, to be equal but different called to faithful relationships. And in healthy relationships, in healthy churches, they are known as places where people faithfully encourage one another towards God's best. Uh, the Greek word for Holy Spirit, by the way, is, a, is, the, is the Greek word parakleia, which means um, encouragement, if you like, the great encourager. It means to come alongside, uh, to bring courage to another. And when we encourage one another, we bring courage that comes from a greater source than simply our best uh, thoughts and affection. Uh, I heard someone the other day uh, listening to uh, a, a fellow person with a problem and uh, the response to that problem, uh, I was overhearing this at a cafe, uh, uh, the person said to the other person with the problem, uh, I'll have good thoughts for you. And I thought, well, what good is that? Good thoughts for you. We have something offer that is better than good thoughts. We have the encouragement of the Holy Spirit in our lives to bring into each other's life, to bring courage. In Hebrews 10 and verse 24, the Bible says, let us think of one another and how we can encourage one another to love and to do good deeds. In other words, let's spend some time dreaming up ways that we could bring courage into another person's life. And the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to be faithful and to come along one, uh, alongside one another and to offer encouragement, to bear one another's burdens, to not just let things left unsaid if there's an issue. I could not find in the New Testament anywhere uh, any of the one anothering statements that include this statement. Uh, never does it say scrutinise one another or embarrass one another or shame one another or try to fix one another or judge one another, or run one another's lives, or intensify another one's sufferings, or point out another one's failings. It doesn't say any of that. The Bible says that we are to love and encourage one another, to be for each other, as hard as that is sometimes, and as easy as that is sometimes. We are to be faithful in our relationships. But not just faithful in our relationships one to another, but faithful in our calling. Um, uh, Craig Rochelle, who's a uh, pretty contemporary, popular sort of author and speaker uh, in the United States, he said this interesting thing. He said, we are not called to be famous, we are called to be faithful. We are not called to be famous, we're not called to be celebrities, we're simply called to be faithful. So we are to be faithful in our relationships and in our calling. A church community is more than simply a place to attend and be served and consumed. It is a place to serve, a place to express what God has placed in our hands and our heart and to express that for the betterment of that body and therefore for the world in which we live. Being in church should never, ever be a spectator sport. I, I saw this uh, really good picture the other day. Uh, you might get a laugh out of it. Some people, that's church for them, uh, that church is like that. But I, I, I saw this uh, good quote about church. It says that the church is often like a football stadium where 22 people need a rest, but it's watched by thousands of people who desperately need exercise. And that can happen in churches as well, where all sorts of people are all sorts of points of exhaustion and a whole bunch of people sit back and say, well, can you do more? Do I have to? You see, when the Spirit of God was in us and stirs us up, it's not that we have to enlist people 
but they want to serve because of the faithfulness of God to them. The local church in the scriptures is described by various analogies and metaphors uh, like the bride of Christ, the, the building, a family. Uh, the, one of the main ones is a body, a body whose head is Jesus Christ. And we're told that every follower of Jesus Christ is placed in that body by the Holy Spirit. And then in addition to that, they are given gifts of the Holy Spirit so that they might add to that body uh, for the good of all who are in it. It says in 1 Peter 4 and 10 that every Christian should use whichever gift he or she has received, so it's assumed you have at least one, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You see, in Acts chapter 1, we learn that Jesus' last command is the church's first priority. And Jesus' last command was to go into the world and to make disciples, to demonstrate the love and grace of God. So we have labour to do, we have work to do. Faithfulness in our relationships, faithfulness in our calling, and thirdly, faithfulness in what we believe. Now this is a a bit of a trickier one, uh, especially in the climate in which we live. But faithfulness in what we believe. Now this is a bit of a minefield uh, because, well, which believes? What behaviours? Uh, uh, you think that, I think this, and we'll all get to heaven eventually, that kind of stuff. Well, there is a sense in which there has been such plurality and relativism in our world that to hold to certain beliefs is almost seen as a kind of an old world thing to do. But here's the problem. The problem is when everything is true, nothing is true. I come across this great quote a while ago, and I use this from time to time, that in essentials there should be unity, in the non-essentials there should be liberty, but in all things there should be charity. The next question is, well, what is the essential? What is the non-essential? Is it all relative? If you believe that and I believe this, and uh, does that mean we're all able to believe those things even though they're diametrically opposed at the same time? Well, that's part of a longer conversation. As a way of illustrating, I remember talking to a guy from our church years and years ago uh, who was, uh, his job was to, uh, he was part of a, a, um, a group of people who identified counterfeit currencies, especially in Australia. And uh, his whole job every day of his working life was to identify uh, counterfeits. And uh, I got talking to him one day over coffee and I said to him, I, I bet your job means that you can, sp- you know, you can spot a fake uh, you know, $50 note or $20 note very quickly. And he said, yeah, I can. Uh, and I said, well, how do, they, how do you learn how to do that? You know, because people are so clever in their, their sort of developing this counterfeit stuff. And he said something that's always stayed with me. He said, well, you know what? We train day after day, year after year, learning every single detail of the authentic currency. And we are so well trained in every minute detail of what is authentic that when a counterfeit is presented, we can spot that in a heartbeat. That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? Maybe the reason we have so much trouble in what we believe is because the counterfeit has become so entwined with the authentic. Perhaps we need to do what we know we need to do, and that is to lean more into the authentic, the Word of God. Here's what the Word of God says about the Word of God. For the Word of God is active and alive, It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. We need to be faithful in what we believe. But in order to do that, we need to work hard at what we believe. And how do we start? Do we listen to our favourite preacher or read a favourite Christian book or whatever we do? What do we do? Well, we start by opening the Word of God and becoming so familiar with it that we can spot fake news, if you like, in an instant. Maybe the reason that we are so unfamiliar with the the inauthentic, I suppose, or the authentic is because we have strayed so much into the inauthentic. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. And God is faithful, that God is faithful to you, that he is faithful to me. 
that God is faithful and we are called to be faithful in our calling and in the ways of Jesus Christ. In a moment or two, we're going to sing another song that talks about the faithfulness of God. And I hope that as we sing it, you might be reminded of being urged on to a faithful life, that you might ask God to allow you to show faithfulness. And as we sing it, um, do so knowing that God is faithful to you. It was silent as the grave that Saturday, the midnight of those three days. If all of time stretched out in a line, those hours would be the fulcrum of history. 
seeds that bloomed in those three days were planted in the garden where God breathed life into us, fanned our hearts to flame, gave us a choice. But we picked the rancid fruit of rebellion and threw away the core of his love. And from that second to this, we all need a second chance, but we can't find it ourselves. We need God to intervene. So Jesus, the redeeming God-man, stepped onto the tightrope of time to walk with us, to show us the way to live and love. From Adam and Eve's choosing tree to Jonah's three days in darkness, all of the Old Testament shined a spotlight on this coming rescuer, weaving threads that all lead to those three days. From Christ's birth to his miracles to today, the three days are the fuse and the focus of all eternity and the echoes are still shaking culture and shaping hearts centuries later. Dostoevsky wrote, God and the devil are fighting, and the battlefield is the heart of man. He understood that the vital struggle is a spiritual one with our hearts hanging in the balance. Bach signed sonatas with the initials INJ, Latin for in the name of Jesus. His sacred work, St. Matthew's Passion, set the story of the three days to music. He composed using a translation of Matthew's Gospel by theologian Martin Luther. During his lifetime, Bach was best known as a church organist. In 1929, another church organist gave birth to a son named Michael. At the age of five, the boy's parents changed his name to Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. King later declared, man cannot save himself. Bound by the chains of his own sin and finiteness, man needs a savior. The artist Michelangelo put it this way, Do not fret. God did not create us to abandon us. I serve for the love of God, and in him have all my hope. His statue of David portrays the poet king who composed the 40th Psalm, calling out for the long-awaited deliverer. Bono sang Psalm 40 at Red Rocks. You too played their recasting of David's Psalm at 74 beats per minute. That's an average resting human heart rate. 366 years after Christ's sacrifice on the cross, Augustine prayed, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Augustine saw that the only cure for our hearts is found in Jesus in three days. On that Saturday night, it looked like death had won. It sounded like God was dead. It was silent as the grave. But then, Sunday happened. Time was up for death. Life and light supernaturally burst forth. The once dead heart of Jesus found its rhythm. Blood and breath danced again to the beat in his chest. And by the power of his resurrection, our gravestones are rolled away. By his comeback, we can come back to the Father, courageous, free, beloved, and unashamed. He is the Christ, and he is victorious. We are alive. Because there was Friday, the night love died. But then there was Sunday, the day death ended. <laughs>